Test, test. Sounds good. All is great. <laughs> For many years already, everything about. Ouais, ça va. Hein? Et ça, c'est bas en plus. Donc, ça va. Oh, c'est vite, hein? Oui. Great. Works for me. <laughs> Check and thank you. <laughs> bah, ça va, bon, honnêtement. Euh, oui. Oui. Ouais. Ça va être une salle bien pleine. Oui. C'est avec le volume et tout. Ouais, c'est super. Hein. Okay. Moi, c'est bon. <laughs> Uh, do you think that um, 
the, the, the presenter will interfere with the... You think? Yeah. One, two. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Le son est super. Ouais.
Bonjour. Good afternoon. I'm Gaëtan Bruel, Cultural Counselor of the French Embassy and Director of Villa Albertine, and it's really my pleasure, together with the team, to welcome you all today for the second day of our Proust weekend. I can recognize some of you among those who were with us uh, yesterday, and thank you also to the new faces who have joined us for this afternoon. With this Proust weekend, we wish above all to celebrate the diversity and vitality of Marcel Proust's work on the occasion of his centennial. Indeed, Marcel Proust has a lasting influence on the arts and society. He has inspired, and still does, artists, thinkers, authors all around the world. A lot of recent projects uh, rooted in his work have seen the light. And here at Villa Albertine and Albertine Bookstore, we even took the name of one of his most famous characters, Albertine. Since yesterday morning, we welcomed more than 50 children to participate in small formats, uh, small original workshops to discover Proust. And in fact, through this festival, we also want to show that Proust is accessible to all, no matter your age or interest, whether you have read the seven volumes of La Recherche in search of lost time, or you just heard about him two days ago, thanks to the Atlantic. <laughs> Yesterday afternoon, we had the chance to host a lively roundtable about Proust adaptations, translations, and reception, followed by a, a spotlight on Proust in Hollywood, before learning all about Proust's work in a one-hour live performance. This afternoon's program remains in the spirit of a festive open to all celebration of Marcel Proust. And stay on your toes because we have many surprises in store for you across the afternoon. We are pleased to launch this afternoon with a discussion between Olivier Mundai, an associate creative director at The Atlantic, and Caroline Weber, notably the author of Proust Duchess and Barnard Professor. And this discussion is presented in partnership with The Atlantic on the discovery or rediscovery of Proust's work during the pandemic. We will then move at 3.30 um, to move on to a gourmet sequence, if I may say, beginning with a reading by actress D. Besnael, three parts three chef, chef Unjin Lee from Lisée, chef Jimmy Leclerc from La Durée, and chef Sébastien Rouxel from Boulou have honored Proust by doing their reinterpretation of the Madeleine. And before tasting their creations, they will talk with journalist Adam Gopnik about the link between food and memory, uh, which was dear to Marcel Proust. I warmly thank all the speakers who agreed to uh, spend the Sunday with us and to take part in this Proust weekend, as well as the Villa Albertine team, in particular the Books Partnership and Communication team, as well as the Bookshop team. Enjoy the festival. Thank you. Thank you, Gaëtan. Uh, thank you, everyone at uh, Villa Albertine and Service Culturel for having us. And thank you very much. And thank you. I keep calling him Olivier also, but <laughs> Oliver, are, we, are you Olivier for the day? Um, anyway, <laughs> it's, it's always a treat to get to be here and especially to talk about Proust. And I was thrilled when um, the people at Villa Albertine asked me to Get, come and talk to you because I loved your article about reading Proust in the pandemic. And since that's kind of our overarching theme, would you be willing to sort of share for anybody who hasn't gotten to the article yet what what led you to that experience and what it was like? Sure. Um, can you all hear me? I, I mean, I think that there are a lot of aspects of Proust that would lend itself to being read during the pandemic, but. <clears throat> It was really, a friend of mine just said he was, he was gonna do it and read the books in succession. So of course I was, you know, in my mind I was like, oh, should I do that too? And then I thought, no, that's too much. <laughs> I had read the first volume years ago and didn't, I didn't really connect with it. It was a little bit, um, I think it was the wrong time for me. Um, but I needed something sort of like momentous in the way that it, it seemed it would be to, to read it. Um, and that's sort of how it started. I think a lot of people were turning to, people were listening to their record collections, you know, alphabetically over time and <laughs> baking through all sorts of cookbooks. Um, so it was sort of the reading equivalent of that. I, it's hard to find as many books where you can, you know, where you have so much to get through. Um, and that was really 
that was how it started. And then it, it took on a kind of life that I would, you know, couldn't have anticipated at all. And it was a much different, I mean, reading the first book anew, it was like I hadn't read it before. Yeah. And that was, I, I, I've heard that that's a lot of people's experiences, you know, reading it is, it really becomes a different thing altogether. Um, and so that, once that took hold, it was sort of, I, I couldn't really stop until I, you know, finished. And did you, how long did it take you in total? Did you, was the pandemic kind of, if the pandemic is in fact over, was the, was the, was the I'm still reading I, it no, now, totally. yes, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, so are you, no, 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 yeah, no, I was going to say, I don't want to spoil yeah, right. any no, no. The ending. I did finish, yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't remember how long it took. Yeah. Six, six months maybe, or okay. longer than that. I don't know if that, something like that. Um, and I, I had to take a break to read stuff for work, you know, every so often, but it really was a, sustained experience in a way that I don't think I could have pulled off had I not had those, you know, months locked down. Even with a young kid, which is difficult, yeah. there was still yeah. time, nap time, you know, at night. And, <laughs> you know, when I would just like lay on the floor and, and read. And so it was like a, yeah, it was, it was exactly what I needed at that time. Yeah. And I think you and I talked, uh, we chatted a little bit on the phone a few days ago, and um, we talked a bit about how since one of the big themes of the novel is obviously time, mm -hmm. and time assumed such strange dimensions during the pandemic, it, I can imagine, I joked to you that I had spent the last seven years before the pandemic rereading Proust because I was yeah. writing a book. And so for me during the pandemic, the, the one thing I didn't have to do was read Proust. Um, so, <laughs> so I read War and Peace instead and had a similarly, transcendent experience. Yeah. I couldn't believe how much I loved it. And I used to always say to people at like book events or whatever about Proust and they'd say, well, how do you do it? Or do I have to read the whole thing? And I would say, if I weren't a French professor, I'm not sure I would have the time mm, to have exactly. read it. Yeah. And like you, I tried it multiple times. I didn't love it the first time I read Swan's yeah. Way when I was young. And it took a while. Uh, so getting to read anything other than Proust was also really fun for me, but I thought a lot about Proust during the pandemic just because how strange the experience Absolutely. of time became. Yeah. And at once very slow and then very quick. There's that quotation I love in the early on in Swan's Way where uh, the, the narrator is describing somebody sleeping and he says, a man who sleeps holds in a circle around him the, th what is it, le fil des, des heures, the, the thread of the hours and the order of years and mm. worlds. And I think that line is such a great description of not only the person who sleeps, but the person who reads Proust. Yeah. That you know, you have, you're circumscribed in this crazy kind of temporal experience, mm -hmm. and also you're immersed in all these worlds, which is yeah. of huge value, I think, if you're isolated in the pandemic. Yeah, no, I mean, our, our lives were circumscribed in a way that they hadn't been before, and I think that, that <clears throat> it had a really distorting effect on time. And, you know, for what's so important in Proust among many things is the, is the like the involuntary nature of memory which is h hard in the in the pandemic all of the me like everybody was sort of going back but it was very voluntary and it's a much different thing you have to search I think that there is you know there, there is more sort of inaccuracy in that yeah. search for that time as opposed to being flooded with something which habit gets in the way of as he, he talks about so often and we were you know we had to form these new habits in the pandemic, being indoors and, and being really kind of constrained. And that yeah. is, a, it, it's a very bizarre, I mean, we all know, it's a, it was a very bizarre, especially in the first four or five months when it was really, you know, everybody was kind of inside. Yeah. I tried to write a thing during the pandemic, come to think of it, I wasn't entirely away from Proust. I started to write a thing and then I just never did anything with it, but about, um, Proust's father's work as a, and then somebody did write an article about this somewhere, yeah. about how Proust's father was this famous epidemiologist. Yeah. His father basically was one of the inventors of the field of yeah. public health and went all over Europe and parts of Africa, France, Europe, and parts of Africa, setting up cordon sanitaire and trying to control uh, like epidemics of malaria, yeah, for instance, absolutely. most famously. And I, I tried to write something about the relationship between the kind of the narrator and 
sickness and pandemic. And obviously we know that the narrator is a, is a famous hypochondriac and sick right. person and has a lot to say that's very humorous oftentimes about doctors. Yeah. But um, I, I wasn't really able to find in Proust, we were chatting about this in the green room, that it seems like Proust has written about every aspect of human experience. And then it's really surprising when you find one that's missing. <laughs> so I have four dogs and they define so much of what happens to me every day. And Proust didn't like animals and there are no, there are certain, there's no household with four dogs in yeah, the Recherche. No. <laughs> so that experience, but similarly, you know, nobody in the Recherche is living what we were living during the pandemic. No, right. And yet, as you say, uh, the experience of having to form new habits, I think, is something that Proust would have so deeply approved of. Because mm. for him, we miss so much by just going yeah. through a routine and not noticing what's around us. Yeah. So I don't know. Did you feel like the being conditioned in that way by Proust to think about habit and that at the same time when you were having to let go of all these habits as all this yeah. were. Did you feel like you were seeing differently uh, even I, I when mean, you weren't yes. in the novel or? And I think, you know, to, to, to your previous point, he, he spent so much time alone in a room <laughs> writing yeah. that you, you know, I mean, there's the, the, obviously there's a similarity there between how we all were circumscribed in, in our spaces. Yeah. Um, there's a kind of containment, I think, that, that that's similar in his process that we experienced. But for me, I th there were these moments of seeing which he describes so um, beautifully and thoroughly um, and sort of inspiringly, like th that made me look at these things that I perhaps was passing over because of familiarity and mm -hmm. habit. And the, you know, how, um, so it just has a dulling effect over time. Yeah. And so to stop and look at things, I think, you know, to, to be very sort of overly simplistic about it, that's the beginning of the Proustian project is to notice, and then it's the, the surface is only the surface of something greater and deeper, which ultimately is sort of unknowable, but still there's something there, and he tries to sort of build that out. And so to see the world in that way for a while, I mean, it has since died down, but for right. a while it was like, you know, like somebody had, it was like the colors were all vivid, and the, the mm. just the sort of external world had a, very different shimmering quality to it um, that lasted for a little bit. And it was like a, it felt like a renewed sense of something when, you know, my experience was was rather dull and sort of rote and boring. Yeah. In these small moments, it could all of a sudden be opened up. And that I thought was very beautiful. Just, I have never had an experience, I think, like that, where a book has changed my, like my the act of perception in that, in, in that kind of direct uh, way. Yeah. You know, you can think, but it was almost not involuntary, but pretty close, you know? I mean, reading and spending so much time with his mode of inquiry, you can't help but start to sort of adopt it as your own. Yeah, I, I can't remember, I often confuse the slightly mean and slightly flattering things that Gide said about Proust with the slightly mean and slightly flattering things that Cocteau said about Proust. But <laughs> one of the two of them described his eyes. I mean, actually, you know, so it's metaphorical, but they, yeah. they said that his he had like the eyes of an insect that had little mm. kind of facets and that they were seeing on so many different levels yes, at once, all at once and, yeah. it, and it is, you know, it's an image that's creepy, but appropriate very and accurate. very yeah. accurate. And I do think there is this kind of heightened perception that comes with, with being in yeah. Proust. I, I mean, to me, it can almost sometimes feel a little terrifying. Like I yes. had an, I had a wardrobe malfunction in the green room <laughs> and um, <laughs> involving my belt and my, the button on my pants. And it, it was so embarrassing, but I found myself thinking, oh, thank God Proust isn't here because like that's a kind of, that's just <laughs> one part, you know, that's just like five everything. words. He would have seen it <laughs> and it would have been so merciless and so hilarious and I would have never recovered from it when I saw that about myself in his book. But, um, but the idea that you're always so... Um, laid bare to mm. kind of perception and yeah. to, to sensory material coming in or social material Absolutely. coming in. Yeah. I, I mean, the social material, did you, that's where I go when I just want to have a good chuckle, you know, is some of the scenes in the salon or the oh, it's, horrible I mean, dinner party. And in hilarious. Yellow. And I, I felt like that was what I sort of was a little bit nostalgic for during the pandemic when yeah. a very good friend of mine and of many of ours here, uh, who's a great Proust reader, uh, 
called Robert Couturier, he, he called me early on in the pandemic and said, darling, this means that you and I maybe never have to see certain people again. And I thought, <laughs> oh, right. And we all had that in the pandemic, right? Like, yeah. oh gosh, you know, the lunch was so-and-so that I always did out of obligation or whatever that is. Um, so, and yet it's careful what you wish for, because also when you're by yeah. yourself, in my case with your husband and your dogs for that long, it is kind of fun to go back and think, oh, right, yeah. but yeah, dinner parties are horrible, but they're really entertaining when somebody does something like this. Yeah, so it's like Succession and Belle Epoque. Oh, yeah. You know I mean? Like he was so cutting and wry and how he depicted those, like the absurdity yeah. of those yeah. social events and gatherings. Um, but I think something you just said reminded me of, as we were talking about, you know, people being um, ruthless in their appraisal of, uh, of Proust, it's... The, that overwhelming sense of, it's like sensory overload. That, yeah. One of the things, I, as we talked about a few days ago, going back to, to Beckett's book on Proust, which he wrote early on before he wrote his novels, yeah. there's a, a lot in there about, about habit and, and time, but in particular, the, this, this idea that all of the, like the sort of existential dread that one feels is all predicated on this overwhelming free play of the senses. Yeah. And yeah. it, it does have a sort of like this, when it bears down on you, I mean, that's, and habit is a sort Protection. of- Protection. Exactly, against that. Yeah. And so it, it, it's both of those things at play in Proust. It's yeah. like without, you can't have involuntary memory without habit because in those like moments of rupture, that's when it comes spilling out. Right. Um, and I think that that's why it's just so exciting to read. Yeah. Um, for those, you know, unexpected moments. Um, and it's funny because I, like Beckett and Proust were both, they did a similar thing in very different ways. Like they were trying to write the unwritable. Yeah. And Proust the did unnameable. it through mm -hmm. this excess of, of, of prose and, and Beckett does it in a kind of compressed way. But there's a similar sense of uh, like the, 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 the dueling forces of pessimism and optimism, which are often confused in both of their work. Yeah. They're, they're both there and present in similar ways, but they're just, formally so, so different. But to read him on, it, it's, he's incredible on Proust. It's so the weirdest weird and, book. and amazing. It's the weirdest Very book. Very bizarre. It's like 70 pages, but yeah. yeah. The thing that I'm now remembering that, I, that really struck me about the Beckett book, and for Proustians here who are interested, it is worth a read, if, if only because it is so short. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> he, he talks about the fact and it was so helpful to me. I had a colleague, I have, an, I have a colleague in the English department at Columbia who said to me at some dinner or something or other while I was in the middle of my seven or eight years of just all Proust all the time. And he sat down next to me at a dinner and, he, and I was very happy to just be at a dinner and not be at home writing about Proust. And he turned to me and he said, well, you know, you're writing about Proust and my question about Proust is, are all of those characters really as horrible as I think they are? And I, I, I thought, <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah. Why? Yes. Yeah. Actually, the answer is yes. Like maybe the grandmother, no, but like the rest of them are horrible. And, and you, you can say the same thing about Beckett's kind of imaginary oh, cosmos. Yeah. Like everybody's horrible. But the thing that Beckett says in that book that I really loved and that kind of gave me some solace after having to realize that I w had devoted my life to an author who <laughs> is only writing horrible characters, um, is this idea that there's no, there's actually no moral judgment in Proust. Yeah. Like that, you know, the narrator sees everything. Mm. The narrator repeatedly tells us how he doesn't see anything and, you know, he misses things and 3,000 pages later he finally realizes yeah. something he should have seen, but he kind of saw it enough to be able to go back to it later. Um, but there's, even if it's cruel, and the writing, especially the social comedy, is often cruel, it does seem to be actually strangely without judgment, devoid of judgment. Yeah. There's no like, oh, well, Madame Verdurant is so awful that you really kind of maybe want to see her, get her come right. up into the end, and she never does. Yeah. Like, he's created a character who keeps mm -hmm. being that awful, more or less, without any consequences. And so there is this also, I think, in addition to the dizzying effect and the kind of existential dread that you mentioned of yeah. kind of an overload of, of sensory perception. There's also a kind of a dizzying effect to you're in a universe without morality uh, and yeah. without moral judgments and like habits, those kind of simplify the world, right? Yeah. You cling to one and you know, yeah, X is absolutely. bad and so-and-so is good and I'm rooting for Y. Yeah. I mean, Everything even in succession. And reduced, yeah. Um, is there anyone in succession that we're rooting for though, come to think of it? 
I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> except, except you pick the one that's the most awful and you maybe love them, yeah. like Madame Vail I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, right. It's fun. But, I mean, can you imagine, re- like, a moralizing Proust? Nobody would no. be able to get through that. No, exactly. Right? No, exactly. Yeah. And I think so that I is... So I think that's a really good point. It, it is part of the reason why it works so well, I think, is because he is, he renders every, everyone in such a deep and vivid way without those moral judgments that can kind of weigh down that, uh, the, book, the book that it might have been had he, you know rendered his judgment. Yeah. yeah. I read a paper once about basically sons of doctors in French literature, and the two big ones were Flaubert and, yeah. um, and Proust. And there is a kind of a very similar oh, mentality yeah. and sensibility in that sense of just the kind of the, the methodical dissection of oh my, human yeah. character. And again, it's without pity, um, but yeah. it's also, it leaves you with an amazing but kind of a searing... it's authentic for it. Yeah, yeah a searing exactly. sense of reality. Um, did you have, what were like favorite moments for you? Just be, if, when you, when you reread it this time, what were the, were, what moments surprised you or what moments stand out as kind of like your steeples of Martinville? Yeah. What were the, what were the big... I mean, big... The, the trees outside of, of Baalbek in the same way, were, yeah. that was a, a miraculous moment. And I think that you know, the first reading him the first time around, as we were talking about, he's, he's sort of like, when I was younger, I was like, this this young kid is just such a mama's boy. He just <laughs> want, he's he just wants a kiss. From, like, get over it, man. Like, can we move on? And now it's like he's a he's so sensitive, and you realize that those, almost in like a Freudian way, like these foundational moments of loss or fear or whatever that often stem from our relationships with our family. Yeah. They animate everything, yeah. and to see it in that way, like slightly more mature, I think that it, it, it was a different book for that reason. But the, I mean, there's so many. The, the, I mean, the trees in particular. I remember there was one. There's a scene in um, the seaside. Is it Ballback, the seaside town? Yeah. When he's with the yeah, painter yeah. Elstir, mm-hmm. and there's a beautiful description of a, a messy table, mm-hmm. um, and the, the way that it's used in the scene, I mean, there are parts of it I can't remember, but I just remember being bowled over. I mean, it's, everything is described to a T, the light off of the spoon and the way that the napkins are. It's, it was just like such a feast, this like messy feast of description. Um, and that was, that was one that sort of comes back to me. But the, it's just, you know, so many, the, the red shoes toward the end. Oh, the, yeah. I mean, like devastating moments. Um, yeah, that one's so crushing. yeah. And the, the 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 with his grandmother, where he's sort of like, there's this delayed response to her. Yeah, to her death. So, uh, to pull that off, I mean, yeah. and to come back, it has the force of something that you have even experienced over the course of years. You know, yeah. it's yeah. So, too many to name. It's. I, I'm just getting chills hearing you talk about it. I mean, everybody who's here, uh, there may be, again, people who only heard of Proust a few days ago because of your article in The Atlantic, but <laughs> but uh, other people here maybe are here because you already have read and loved Proust or not loved him or want to know why people do love him. Um, but I just, there's the famous passage where he's describing the um, the death of the writer Belgot, and uh, which is... Obviously, I heard a little yeah, sigh of appreciation <laughs> somewhere in the office. Like, like um, but where you know, another thing that Proust really doesn't write about is is God or mm. or spirituality in in that book. And that you know, there are a number of reasons probably for that. And I don't feel that dearth as acutely as I feel the dearth of of um, animal companions in the <laughs> <Of Lachelle. dogs. laughs> But um, but hearing you just kind of rattle off a few moments, including one I don't remember. I don't have a memory of the of the messy table scene. And now there's I'm, a there's uh, a bit of translate. I have a question for you after oh, yeah, the fact. Yeah. I can't. There was one word that was that was used in such a a kind of beautiful and unexpected way, and I don't know if it was an accurate or a inaccurate oh, okay. English to French translation. Like a weird Gallicism or something. Yeah, but it was it? just it's just so. Beautiful. I'll find it. Okay. But I can't remember it off the All top right. of my head. But okay. To be continued. Yeah. Yes. We've decided we we're, we're going to need more time <laughs> than the time that we're allotted here. Um, but don't we won't over, we won't overkeep you. But no. But what I was thinking about hearing you just kind of rattling off these moments and thinking about what we were talking about in the green room before that, you know, you we're both writers and I can spend days on a page 
and feel at the end of it, like, oh, I, I guess that's pretty good now, and I guess I can live with it. And then I go back a few days later, and it's like, this is the worst thing. It's terrible. <laughs> How did I not see that I repeated something twice? Like, writing that well is so hard that it's on the, in Proust, it's on the order of the miraculous. And when you say, like, Absolutely. the grandmother and pulling it off. And the reason I bring this up in connection with the death of Belgut is I think that that's the only time in the novel where he actually um, kind of touches on the idea of, you know, kind of an afterlife or resurrection or whatever, and you mm -hmm. all know what I'm talking about, that, you know, he, d there's the famous line, so it's Bergut dies in this kind of ignominious way, having eaten raw, you know, undercooked potatoes, and yeah. he's in front of the the view, the Vermeer's view of Delft at the at the Louvre, and the, the narrator says, you know, he was, he, Bergut was dead, dead forever, who can say? And then he goes on to kind of say, you know, who knows if maybe, there isn't some other order of being, some realm that is not like ours because it's a realm where it actually is of the first, the foremost ethical mm -hmm. importance to do nothing but get a perfect version of a little patch of yellow wall to, you know, and the world won't yeah. reward, this world won't reward you for that just the way this world won't reward you for kindness or goodness or anything else. But maybe people like that have actually come here from another realm or register of experience, and that's yeah. why they're able to do what they do, even if it makes no sense to us in this world and life mm -hmm. that they could possibly do something like that. And yeah. I, one, again, one of his many bits of genius is that he could actually articulate that, and I think is talking about himself. I mean, yeah. obviously, I like, mean, I think how does anybody do what he did? No, and Bergot was kind of his god in a way. Right. Like, he just, I mean, that's why he's doing what he's doing. And yeah. so, and there are all these moments of, to me, that I experienced as a kind of spirituality, like the the steeples and the trees. There's a, to go back to Beckett again, I'm, I'm obsessed with him, but he has this like, the the, the image of a, of a mobile, where right. it's like these various um, elements that are all contingent and all in motion. And I think that those, the steeples and the tree, where you, as a being, you are in, you're, you're sort of like in motion always, and you have a relationship to the thing, and there's time and space, and the way that they all sort of come together, he, it is something that I think we've all experienced, yeah. but, but it is so impossible to articulate why it feels otherworldly or like there is something contained in that experience and he, he he just did that as close as you can come. and that that to me feels very spiritual without being explicitly you know stated or described yeah. as such like those moments are very profound and they they capture something very essential about being human someone who perceives the world in that way yeah um so yeah i think it, it maybe it's even a higher order of spirituality. Yeah, and yet, you know, Proust is so French in this way of, I just came back from, from Italy for Thanksgiving, and I was reading this essay by Stendhal on the, on the plane on the way home, where he said that the, the Italians, in contrast to the French, have no sense of the ridiculous, which is a funny <laughs> statement in and of itself, but he goes on to say that, you know, that French culture, people are always conscious of yes. being ridiculous, and it's like you're trying too hard, or you're, mm -hmm. and I think that one of the amazing things, uh, thinking about, like, the steeples at Martinville, the amazing things that Proust does in that passage is this unbelievable kind of, he's describing what it's like to have a kind of transcendent aesthetic experience and then to be able to actually capture it mm -hmm. in writing. And the narrator says, well, you know, and I, I wrote this page down and yeah. looking at it again, I probably really wouldn't change anything in it. And it felt so good when I had finally delivered myself of this page that I could do nothing more than cry out clucking happily like a hen <laughs> who had laid an egg. And then you just think, okay, that's so genius too. Like it's yeah. one of the most uplifting passages anybody can ever read, but the kind of the grace note at the end is yeah. like writer as little happy little clucking chicken. Yeah. And it's so, <laughs> it's so amazing the way he undercuts yeah. the sort of the seriousness and the gravity mm -hmm. too of what he's doing and, yeah. the, and the the majesty of it those moments of humor also just make me oh my gosh, love him yeah. so much absolutely um, yeah there's an awareness i mean if, if he took himself i mean he has to take himself seriously in order to pull this off but if he took himself too seriously it would be insufferable i mean yeah. you couldn't 
I don't know that you could get through it. It would be yeah. impenetrable. Yeah, no, I mean, the humor, <laughs> I always tell my students now that the one thing I want them to take away from Proust is that he's funny. Because I feel like if I can yeah. get people seeing the the humor, yeah. maybe they'll stick around for the for the other stuff. Absolutely. But, no, no. I mean, you, can, you could tell someone to read Proust in so many different ways and they would have a completely new experience of the book. Like reading for humor would change yeah. someone. I mean, you'd, yeah. you'd go in, going in knowing that. Yeah. It would be different. So do we, were other people here, did other people here read Proust during the pandemic? Did anyone else kind of tackle them? Do, are, are we going to need another pandemic for people to, to do more? <laughs> Have we not made the case that you can actually read him on, even though I've just said I had to be a French professor in order to, to take several stabs at Proust. But I don't know. We, there's, um, uh, I, I know a, a man in New York who's been working on a book about Proust, and I haven't seen the book yet, but he wants to make the case for Proust, uh, Proust's novel as kind of a very early and interesting version of social media. And I, the kind of the... The counterintuitiveness wow. of that argument really fascinates me because it seems yeah. like what you need in Proust above all is is concentration. You know, to he needs the concentration in order to see mm. what he sees and write the way he writes. And then we need concentration and like maybe right. the artifice of a pandemic to be forced at home with nothing to do other than yeah. read Proust. Um, but the flip side is, yeah, is there a way in which the fact that he contains multitudes and that there are all these worlds and all these facets. Is that akin to kind of plunging into the dizzying endless variety of the, of the internet or Instagram or something? I don't know, but I'd like to make the argument that instead of social media, people could spend a little more time on Proust and I don't know how, <laughs> I, I don't know how many converts I'm going to win over to that. It seems cause. incredibly dissimilar, but I, I mean, I'm sure he has some very interesting take on it that would, you know, make it seem otherwise, but it, social media is the, there's such a disparate, you know, uh, amount of stuff that... And the quality this, is really variable, I think. Yeah, I mean, if like, you... <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> at very least. Yeah, I mean, in Proust, you know that you're going to... Any page you open, there's going to be something really amazingly good on it. Yeah. Whether it's hilarious oh, or wise sure. or beautiful or weird, uh, there's going to be something worthwhile on yeah. any page in Proust. That would be a fun project. Just like everybody yeah. now take your seven volumes and open up to one page and yeah. then what did we find? And Proust there's not a the bad TikTok page. Age. That's what we Proust need. in the TikTok age. Yeah. Maybe I could finally make some money we doing. Do it. Let's yeah, do it. Yeah, let's we'll do that. Work, all right. We'll work um, on it. You, know, you all heard it here first. Well, I think <laughs> um, I think I saw a wave. So maybe are we um, are we opening to questions now? Are we did people would people like to talk to us about their experiences of Proust in the pandemic or otherwise, Proust and time, Proust and space, yeah? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so great. There was in that, to that point, there's a really beautiful article that just came out. Um, and thank you for telling us about that because I want to look that up. Yeah. Um, there was a really great article that just came out a few days ago in The Guardian, um, written by a woman whose name I can't remember now. I think the last name is Miller. She's a novelist. Did you see this about... Mm -hmm. um, about having Proust read aloud to her. And you know, the, the, this, the article opens with kind of a strange line. It says like, you know, a few years ago, my reader and I decided that we were gonna, so this is somebody who goes everywhere with someone who reads to her. And, um, <laughs> and she described, which just seems very Proustian yeah, too. Like gonna obviously, <laughs> you know, somebody has to come along to read. But, um, but it, it's really a very beautiful essay and it made me think of yours because the, the timing, it kind of coincided mm. with, you know, reading Proust mostly during the pandemic. and. She talks about how she, this woman had never really been able to appreciate Proust before hearing him read aloud, and then something about the cadences and the rhythms of the sentences uh, she found so uplifting. And the final sentence, which I wanted to try to memorize of her article before we came here and then didn't, or to send to you, but also didn't, <laughs> um, 
is something about how she and at the end of the pandemic, she and her re reader came out of the novel and out of the pandemic kind of like blinking and shocked into the sunlight, but having been reminded that even though it seemed like the world had gotten so much worse in the meantime, that the book reminded them that it was still possible to create instead of to destroy. And so I thought that was also a really kind of lovely takeaway from and a lovely reward mm. for slogging through the, the seven volumes with all their yeah. ups and downs. But I think the idea that we could hear it now, um, especially for people who don't have time or who, you know, like well, listen to, in your car. I mean, to listen on a walk or something outside would be. I, I'm, yeah. We were talking upstairs with the actress who's going to read um, the Madeleine the, the, passage. The, the Madeleine passage. And I'd, I've never listened to an, Proust being read or an audiobook, but a lot of people did that. I, mm. I talked with probably half a dozen people that started listening to the audiobooks during yeah. the pandemic. And I think it's a, probably a completely different but equally amazing experience to be in the work and in the world in that way. Yeah, I did. I listened to a lot of War and Peace in the garden um, while I was kind of making my way through. And I, yeah. I sort of liked it because there was like a very kind of crusty English accented guy. <laughs> and so a lot of the ways in which I was pronouncing different Russian characters in my names right. in my head was not the way he. Yeah, exactly. And then I was <laughs> glad for the education. But um, you have to admit to the audience, too, that you Tolstoy might have given Proust a run for his he money. He did, I know, and I say this in the presence of some of my favorite <laughs> Proustians, but um, but he really did. I think I felt like I was cheating on Proust by <laughs> by reading and by reading somebody who was that great. And there yeah. were things that he did that I couldn't believe that he could do in the way that Proust does, and yet the things that Tolstoy can do are very different from the things mm. that Proust can do. I mean, some of those battle scenes, which are the ones I skipped yeah. over as a kid, are like my favorite scenes in the yeah. book now. And you just, it's like he anticipated the whole art of cinema in all these insane ways. Um, so yeah, I did cheat on Proust with Tolstoy, but <laughs> at least that's not an insult to, you know, no. I didn't cheat on him <laughs> yeah. with TikTok. Um, uh, I think I saw, we saw another hand over here. Yeah, yes, Madame. Uh, Oh, thank you. About the three duchess. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, at first, I was a little uh, staggering book, staggering amount of information. <laughs> I was terribly Obsessive. impressed. Oh, but yes, but we won the obsession with yeah. Proust. But um, I was a little surprised by, by the title, because mm. everybody knows that uh, Madame Verdurin, Laurie Mann, was mm -hmm. Mrs. Strauss. Mm -hmm. And at first, I couldn't understand why you depicted her as mm. a duchess, mm. until I remembered that before she became Princess de Guermont, voilà. Madame <laughs> Verdurin was of the course. Duchess of Duras. Well, exactly. So I think you unraveled there one of secrets, and he has lots of secrets. Yeah. And for that, I wanted to congratulate <laughs> you. Oh, thank so. you. No, thank you. And it's true. I mean, it's funny. That titles are a funny thing, too, because uh, generally, writers don't get to choose them. So that actually was not my um, my chosen title. But, but I was trying to look through this framework of you know, Proust falling in love with what he perceived to be this kind of very elite and 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 um, exclusive world of of the of the aristocracy and the at the fin de siècle, but also kind of trying to individualize the three women who in fact were so different. I mean, and because Madame Verdurin, I hate her and love her so much, <laughs> I would have really enjoyed writing a book just about the, so my book was about the models for the character of the Duchesse de Guermont, so the kind of real life ostensible models for, for this one iconic character. But um, I kind of jokingly asked my publisher if I could maybe do a book about the models for Madame Verdurin, and she was like, nobody's gonna read that. No, no one, no one, no one knows who that is. At least a duchess, people get excited, but you know, maybe it'll It'll be about Meghan Markle. I, there'll be some mistake. My first book was actually about the reign of terror, and it was based on my doctoral dissertation. And I remember I had just sent in the manuscript. Uh, I was living in Lower Manhattan, and I just sent in the manuscript to my publisher when the Twin Towers fell. And I called my editor and I said, I don't think we can put terror in the title anymore. And he said, oh yes, because maybe some people will get tricked into buying it. So <laughs> yes, the reign of terror. So anybody who bought that book because they were hoping for something about um, about 9-11, I apologize. But yeah, so titles, I wouldn't have chosen that title, but, um, but you're right that there is this kind of Proust does, he says famously about the, the, the steeples at Martinville, he said, you know, the, 
if people want to look in my work for the real life experiences that inspired them or the real life steeples or people or whatever who inspired them, they'd have to look for so many. There are so many. And he, he says, you know, so many steeples posed for the portrait of those steeples. Mm. And the same, and I, I just, I love that very Proustian language of, you know, the steeples posing for their portrait. And of course, the people in his life did that too, as as the great Proustians here are, are so well aware. So it was, it was fun to get to write about three of those women and trying to look at some of the aspects that he borrowed from them, but it's a very incomplete and imperfect process. And one, I'm aware that Proust himself would have hated. You know, he repeatedly said, my novel is not a roman à clé. I'm mm. not writing this book to, uh, just as a kind of a disguised commentary on real life people. I'm doing something much bigger, which of course he was, but I'm a biographer, so I, I'm doing something much smaller, which is just writing about some people. Um, and that's a good, distinction to bear in mind when you're spending every day as a writer reading and writing about Proust. If I wanted to be a novelist like Proust, I, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. But being a biographer, you think, okay, I can wake up and I can look in the book and I can look for some things in the life and I can comment on them. But I, I don't know how you read Proust as a novelist and then and, and then think, oh, I'll sit down to write a page or two now. It's so he's, horrifyingly he's daunting. He's have ended so many careers. Yeah, because yeah. Of that. yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, were there other, I think I saw maybe some other hands. Yeah. Hi, it's nice to be here. My name is Paulette, but I Hi. don't usually come here. <laughs> and actually, I wrote a book during COVID, so I didn't read Pr Proust. And I'm not really very familiar with Proust, and I'm wondering, really, I'm curious where I should start if I were a beginner in this venue. Volume one, yeah. and maybe a... Volume one. Yeah. Um, did you come into contact with any good uh, like companion well, books? Well, there is one volume that I... People often ask me which one to read in translation, and I... Um, I teach him and I read him in, in French, but I've looked at a bunch of the translations for different reasons over the years and have been really impressed by all of them in different ways, I mm -hmm. think. And I'm, I'm glad to be able to say that because while I was reading Tolstoy, I kept thinking like, this is so good in translation that I would have been foolish to decide that I would put it off until someday I learn Russian and can read it in the original. It's just not worth denying yourself of whatever pleasure you can get from the translation. So I would say there's certainly no shame and no reason not to read Proust in translation. But the reason I bring this up in connection with your question is an edition that I really have come to like a lot and recommended to a good friend of mine who's also friends with some of the Proustians here. Uh, when he was starting reading Proust many years ago is um, Bill Carter uh, did this annotated, who's a great biographer of Proust, William C. Carter. And he, with um, in conjunction with Yale University Press, has started doing this annotated translation of Proust, where he's correcting the original Moncrief English translation. But the reason it's so valuable, I think, and um, and the reason I love the idea of it so much and wish everybody had it, is that he does these great kind of footnotes in the, the like in vertical columns alongside the text, and somehow it feels mm. less disruptive to read. And what I learned as a biographer and an historian when I was writing my book about Proust is just how much kind of current events, you know, how many contemporary people who were real people in Paris and real books that people were talking about and you know not only the kind of real or imagined society figures but just who was president at a particular moment or you know what was what was Sarah Bernhardt performing on stage and it's he's called William C Carter and he and so and he provides all of that in the columns and so you really actually I think part of why I didn't love Proust the first time I tried him when I was very young is that mm. I didn't even have any understanding of that moment in history or that moment in society and Carter gives it all in this very you know it's very succinct but it's incredibly helpful and um, and he's just he's a great scholar of Proust so uh, it, yeah it's Yale University Press and I think four of the seven volumes are already out so if you start reading now <laughs> you'll probably <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one friend of mine did like get through all four volumes and is now furious with me that the five, six, wait. and seven aren't out, and he has to wait. But um, <laughs> but I, I think I do recommend that one the most. And you know, for beginners, we're all beginners when we come to Proust the first time. I mean, nobody yeah. knows until you're in it. Nobody has any understanding of what that can be like. So just do it. And but congratulations on writing your book. That was it. Something about anything related to France or. Oh, okay. That's a, and Pru well then Proust has a lot for you on yeah, that too. Um, 
waves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and that's, uh, that's such a, uh, an important subject, obviously, oh, and also yes. one that, Proust, I think, when you were talking about this kind of the deferred grief over mm. his grandmother, who's the most loved character in the novel, it's incredibly stirring. And I think all the more so when you're... She's the nicest one, I and of course, so. <laughs> and and she dies a death that is so unpleasant and um, and just so gut wrenchingly sad. And yet, the way that the narrator grieves her loss is very peculiar and and feels very human. Very so, human, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so he'll, if you write a if you write a kind of an updated edition sometime after you've read Proust, you'll have some good quotes <laughs> to incorporate. But yeah, other. Oh gosh, um, the one by the couple, the married couple who knew him. Pavira Volkansky, yes. yeah. Volkansky. Yes, thank you, thank you everybody. Do you, you, you approve of that, are you a Tolstoyan? Okay, <laughs> I, I loved it so much. I can't even believe it could be better in Russian, although by definition I'm sure it is, but it was, I really loved it so much. Um, yeah, oh good, all right. I just had, I read the one I had around, but I, I did love it. I think I saw the mic go somewhere else, did you? I just have a question. Um, you said before, uh, you can't have involuntary memory without habit. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that a little bit, please? I think the, what happens when you, something unexpected or surprising comes to you through a sensory experience, through a smell or something like that. And I think that those moments are given force by all of the things that we routinely do in our lives. We, you know, we wake up, we do the same things over and over again, and that gets in the way of of pure involuntary memory. Um, and so, I, I, maybe it was Walter Benjamin or, or 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 Beckett again, but somebody was talking about how how important the um, the not remembering is, um, and that I think is just encouraged by habit. It's it's um, it sort of like impedes. Our, our memory and our experience. And um, so I think that it's that relationship, that, that sort of duality um, that allows involuntary, mem involuntary memory to, to spring on us in the way that it does. Well, it's, it's how does it work with the mental? It, it, because he sees the, um, he sees the, dip. I, I remember for a long time, good. yeah, it's like the, you, the, the, he's in the, the kitchen and it's like the whole it starts to sort of creep up but it's the moment that the cookie soaked in the tea and the, the taste and everything that that it's like when you smell something and it takes you back 20 years in an instant I mean that's involuntary memory you can't you you could try to remember as deeply as possible and you would never you you just can't access that it's something in the subconscious say it again within the context of the ordinary. Yes. Yes, it does, I think, most often. And, and with, like, the... I, I think smell is probably one of the most immediate vehicles for it. And, you know, c tasting and sort of inhaling that, um, it sends you back. I mean, yeah, we can all agree that that's happened to us, and it's kind of... It's miraculous, it feels like, when it does. And, yeah, and, and I think in the context of the ordinary is exactly the right way to put it, which is, I think, what you were getting at yeah. about this dialectic between... We go through most of life not plunged into these kind of like long lost experiences. We go through life and we get on the subway and we put on our clothes and we do whatever we do. Uh, but one of Proust's points also is that involuntary memory that because smell and taste and even hearing to a lesser extent are senses that aren't as kind of directly connected to our cerebral activity. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm seeing this and I'm seeing that you're wearing black pants and I'm seeing these bottles. Of that somehow um, sight is never a vehicle for um, for involuntary memory. It's, it's because sight is too uh, is made too ordinary all the time. We're looking around us all the time, and we don't. And that's why I think the narrator repeatedly says, "I I saw, but I didn't know how to see. I wasn't really looking because yeah. it it's too ordinary. We have to look around us to get through the day most of the time, or most of us. And if we um, didn't have habit, it would just be like constantly. We would be remembering all the time, which right. is an insustainable way to and to live. So to live exactly. Yeah. But you'll hear exactly how it works in Proust's <laughs> eloquent uh, formulation when um, when this oh, actor yeah. comes up to read the the Madeleine passage right after right after we wrap up. So.
that's yeah, that's ending on a high note. I think. Anything? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, are we? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Sure. Thank you both for this conversation. It's wonderful. Um, Olivia, I have a question for you. Um, in terms of the heightened awareness mm -hmm. that one is made privy to when they read Proust, that sensitivity to all the details of life, do you feel that's carried over into your day-to-day -day real life after putting the book down? It did for a little while. I, I, I wish that it, I think that's probably a case to, to, to go back and, and reread, you know, every once a decade or something, which, which I know is, can be extremely rewarding um, because as we were talking about earlier, there's a, he almost, I mean, he builds the case into the work that, you know, you should return often. And I think that that's the way to really experience it. But it, it did last for quite a while. And um, I think it's, it's just the, the notion that there is something to be seen and something to be accessed beyond it is so, I found so intoxicating. And I think the, the fact that it's sort of so difficult to articulate is just part of the power of experience that you don't even need to try and put it into language. It's just something that you can feel and see. Um, so maybe, you know, for a few months, I was definitely, st you know, annoying people on the sidewalk looking at, you know, <laughs> things rising through cracks and the tops of buildings and stuff. But um, I wish it continued because it really, I felt a renewed sense of belief in beauty and, and just the, the beauty of the everyday. So it might be time to go back. Oh, it's already time to yeah, go back. No. <laughs> and maybe I, I want to quote my favorite line from your article, which is past a certain point. <laughs> you like in terms of annoying people, it's like you're going every sentence and every page and there's something amazing. So and I've done this send. with friends yeah. of mine too. And that past a certain point you had, you couldn't even keep typing in your texts, all of the great things <laughs> that Proust was doing. So you just write to people, Proust. Proust, bro. That's it. And just it's like, copy yeah, and paste. Like just proof. Like every single page. If they're that's curious, all. they'll ask. Yeah. yeah. So when you're asked why you're reading him, just Proust, yeah. bro. It's, it, there's <laughs> there's nothing like it. And um, yeah, no, thanks for taking yeah, the time this is to have a chat. Fantastic. Thank you, so fun to team, talk about it. And thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver, and not Olivier, sorry for that, and Caroline, uh, for this fascinating discussion. I invite you all to take a 20, 30 maximum minutes break uh, before the next panel. You can find many books by Proust or on Proust in the next room. And at 3.30, so we'll have a live reading followed by a discussion and a tasting about Madeleine. Thank you. <laughs>
direct. C'est cool, hein, don't you? Vous êtes, so êtes un peu américaine? Bah, du coup, je suis à euh, ouais, bon, peu près, non? Ah, non <rire> je suis à Tchad. Ah, bah, donc, très voilà. bien. Et donc, j'ai grandi au Texas. Et, Génial. Euh, j'ai vraiment eu euh, la dualité. Mes parents m'ont mis dans une école de laïque française. Donc, j'étais wow, okay, de oui, donc, ma euh, première 3 jusqu'à ma troisième. C'est génial. Exact. <rire> Super. Ils se sont mis où nos. Euh, ben, Ils sont à l'entrée. Je ne sais pas. C'est une très bonne question. Et la lecture, ben, ça dure quoi? Ça dure quoi? Ok. Bonjour, bienvenue. Good afternoon. I'm Gaëtan Bruel, director of Villa Albertine and Cultural Council of the French Embassy. And I'm very happy to welcome you all for the second part of this second day of our Proust weekend, celebrating on the occasion of his centennial, the wonderful work of Proust and his universe. Um, it's now my pleasure to launch our afternoon-themed event in search of the lost Madeleine, starting with a live reading by Dee Besnael. Dee is an international stage film and voiceover actor who recently won a Best Actress Award for her work with the seven daughters of Eve Theatre Company's last production. Dee, the floor is yours for the reading. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> For many years already, everything about Combré that was not the theater and drama of my bedtime had ceased to exist for me. When one day in winter, as I returned home, my mother, seeing that I was cold, suggested that, contrary to my habit, I have a little tea. I refused at first, and then, I do not know why, changed my mind. She sent for one of those squat, plump cakes called petites madeleines that look as though they have been molded in the grooved valve of a scallop shell. And soon, mechanically, oppressed by the gloomy day and the prospect of another sad day to follow, I carried to my lips a spoonful of the tea in which I had let soften a bit of madeleine. But at the very instant, when the mouthful of tea mixed with cake crumbs touched my palate, I quivered, attentive to the extraordinary thing that was happening inside me. A delicious pleasure had invaded me, isolated me, without my having any notion as to its cause. It had immediately rendered the vicissitudes of life unimportant to me. Its disasters, innocuous, its brevity, illusory, acting in the same way that love acts, by filling me with a, with a precious essence. Or rather, this essence was not merely inside me, it was me. I had ceased to feel mediocre, contingent, mortal. Where could it have come to me from, the powerful joy? I sensed that it was connected to the taste of the tea and the cake, but that it went infinitely far beyond it, cannot be the same nature. Where did it come from? What did it mean? How could I grasp it? I drink a second mouthful, in which I find nothing more than in the first, a third that gives me a little less than the second. It is time for me to stop. The virtue of the drink seems to be diminishing. Clearly, the truth I am seeking is not in the drink, but in me. The drink has awoken it in me, but does not know its truth. 
and can do no more than repeat indefinitely with less and less force this same testimony which I do not know how to interpret and which I want at least to be able to ask of it again and find again intact, available to me soon for a decisive clarification. I put down the cup of tea and turn to my mind. It is up to my mind to find the truth. But how? Such grave uncertainty whenever the mind feels overtaken by itself, when it, the seeker, is also the obscure country where it must seek and where all its baggage will be nothing to it. Seek? Hmm. Not only that, create. It is face to face with something that does not yet exist and that only it can accomplish then bring itself into light. And I begin asking myself again, what could it be? This unknown state which brought with it no logical proof, but only the evidence of its felicity, its reality, and in whose presence the other states of consciousness faded away. I want to try to make it reappear. I return in my thoughts to the moment when I took the first spoonful of tea. I find the same state again, without any new clarity. I ask my mind to make another effort, to bring back once more the sensation that is slipping away, and so that nothing may interrupt the thrust with which it will try to grasp it again. I clear away every obstacle, every foreign idea. I protect my ears and my attention from the noises in the next room. But feeling my mind grow tired without succeeding, I now compel it to accept the very distraction I was denying it, to think of something else, to recover its strength before a supreme attempt. Then, for a second time, I create an empty space before it. I confront it again with the still recent taste of the first mouthful and feel something quiver in me, shift, try to rise. Something that seems to have been unanchored at a great depth. I do not know what it is, but it comes up slowly. I, I feel the resistance and I hear the murmur of the distances traversed. Undoubtedly, what is palpitating thus deep inside me must be the image, the visual memory, which is attached to this taste and is trying to follow it to me. But it is struggling too far away, too confusedly. I can just barely perceive the neutral glimmer in which the elusive eddying of stirred up colors is blended, but I cannot distinguish the form cannot ask it as the one possible interpreter to translate for me the evidence of its contemporary, its inseparable comparison, the taste. Ask it to tell me what particular circumstances involved, what period of the past. Will it reach the clear surface of my consciousness, this memory? This old moment, which the attraction of an identical moment has come from so far to invite, to move, to raise up from the deepest part of me? I don't know. Now, I no longer feel anything. It has stopped, gone back down perhaps. Who knows if it will ever rise up from its darkness again? Ten times I must begin again, lean down toward it, and each time the laziness that deters us from every difficult task, every work of importance, has counseled me to leave it, to drink my tea and think about only my worries for today, my desires for tomorrow, upon which I may ruminate effortlessly. And suddenly, the memory appeared. The taste was the taste of the little piece of Madeleine which on Sunday mornings at Combray, because that day I did not go out before it was time for mass, when I went to say good morning to her in her bedroom, my Aunt Leonie would give me after dipping it in her infusion of tea and lime blossom. 
The sight of the little Madeleine had not reminded me of anything before I tasted it. Perhaps because I had often seen them in those shops, the pastry shops, on the shelves. And their image had therefore left those days of Combré and attached itself to others more recent. Perhaps because of those recollections, recollections abandoned so long outside my memory, nothing survived. Everything had come apart. The forms and the form, too of the little shell made of cake, so fatly sensual within its severe and pious pleading, had been destroyed or, still half asleep, had lost the force of expansion that would have allowed them to rejoin my consciousness. But when nothing subsists of an old past, after the death of people, after the destruction of things alone, frailer but more enduring, more immaterial, more persistent, more faithful. Smell and taste still remain for a long time. Like souls remembering, waiting, hoping upon the ruins of all the rest, bearing without giving on their almost impalpable droplet the immense edifice of memory. And as soon as I had recognized the taste of the piece of Madeleine dipped in lime blossom tea that my aunt used to give me, though I did not yet know and had to put off to much later discovery why this memory made me so happy, immediately, the old gray house on the street where her bedroom was came like a stage set to attach itself to the little wing opening onto the garden that had been built from my parents behind it. That truncated section, which was all I had seen before then, and with that, the house with the town. From morning to night in all its weathers, the square where they sent me before lunch, the streets where they sent me on errands, the paths we took if the weather was fine. And as in the game enjoyed by the Japanese in which they fill a porcelain bowl with water and steep in it little pieces of paper until then instinct, which the moment they are immersed, stretch and twist, assume colors and distinctive shapes, become flowers, houses, human beings, <laughs> firm and recognizable. So now, all the flowers in our garden, and in M. Swan's Park, and the water lilies of the Vivon, and the good people of the village, all of them in their little dwellings, and the church, and all of Cambrai and its surroundings, all of this, which is acquiring form and solidity, emerged town and gardens alike from my cup of tea. Thank you very much, Dee. It was an amazing reading. Thank you. And now I'm happy to present to you Adam Gopnik, if there is any need to present him. We'll discuss uh, the link between food and memory with three incredibly talented pastry chefs who have imagined their own version of Proust Madeleine. Chef Anjin Lee from Lycée. Lycée is um, a new pastry boutique inspired by three cultures, the French, the Korean, and of course the, the New York City one, and we are very happy to have her with us. Um, chef Jimmy Leclerc, the executive pastry chef for La Durée, and for Boulou, Chef Sébastien Rouxel. So that we have three already legendary uh, brands for pastry together, uh, and I cannot wait uh, to give the floor to Adam. Adam, I just want to say that you have been writing for the New York in 1986, and during these three decades at the magazine, you have published hundreds of essays from personal memoirs to reviews and profiles, along with much reporting from abroad, always as fiction, humor, and art criticism. 
your book, The Table Comes First, uh, addresses the philosophy of eating, uh, and you were made an officer in the Legion of Honor quite recently. Your upcoming book, The Real Work, uh, will be released in March uh, of the next year, uh, and I think you are about to say a word about it. Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today, and a pleasure to hear that wonderful reading of that memorable but never unsurprising passage from uh, early on in, in volume one of what is in the edition I favor, uh, an 11 volume uh, work. I don't think we can think often enough. Should we have it to you? I need a mic? Okay. Yeah, thank you. I thought my voice was sufficiently resonant and trained to carry through, but I will, I will speak to you this way. Um, it is one of the great and astonishing truths, not just of French literature, but of the passage and dialogue of Franco-American literature, that Marcel Proust, of all improbable people, would be not merely recognized universally as a great, a major writer, but would also be an immensely popular writer, bringing us all together on this Sunday afternoon to celebrate not merely his poetic inspiration, but his transformation of our sensual lives, leading uh, even into the way we choose to eat and enjoy a Madeleine. As that wonderful reading reminded us, one of the things that makes Proust an inspired writer is that he connected the sensual and the abstract, the sensory and the psychological, in a way no writer had done before him. And one of the things we relish, I think, and when we read Proust, is his double ability to render the particulars of the world utterly tangible, utterly real, utterly particular, uh, and at the same time to connect those things, like the taste of tea and the very last crumble of a Madeleine, to a much larger structure of individual individual psychology, and eventually, as we unfold the book, or as then book unfolds us, a whole, a whole um, philosophy of time. I would hardly uh, dare to get in the ring with Mr. Proust, to borrow a metaphor from Hemingway for a moment, but one of the things I think that's um, significant about any giant, any major writer, as Proust is in so many of our lives, is that they give um, license and permission to those of us Lilliputians who dance at their feet to explore uh, avenues and ways of feeling and thinking that they have opened up for us. So I thought I would, if you would tolerate, read you a passage from my new book, which this will be the first time I have ever read out loud from it. It's still in Bound Galley. It will be published officially in March of the coming year, at which point, if you go to any bookstore from Altoona to uh, Austin, you will bump into me in a, with a crowd of perhaps five people desperately reading this book over and over again. As any of you know who are writers, that is a writer's fate in America. But I wanted to read you a section from it exactly because it suggests how the Proustian idea that tastes, and particularly the tastes of pastry and bread, are intimately tied to our memories, our childhood memories, and to our feelings about our family, and in particular about our mothers, how evident that can remain. This is a piece I wrote called Baking, a chapter in the book called Baking, that's very much about my Canadian mother and her attempt, her quixotic attempt, to teach me to bake. My mother has always been an expert in-depth explainer, although her children have known to run for doors and leap out windows when she starts to say, well, studies show that. And my mother now explained what yeast was to me. Yeast, my mother explained, is really just a bunch of bugs rooming together, like Oberlin grads in Brooklyn. Eukaryotic organisms of the fungus kingdom, king of mushrooms. She said, when you mix the little bugs with a carbohydrate, wet weed is a good one, they begin to eat up all the oxygen in it, and then they pass gas made up of ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide. The alcohol they pass is what makes spirits. The carbon dioxide is what makes bread. The gas they pass causes the dough to rise. It, what, it's what puts the bubbles in the bread. If you bake it, all you're doing, she explained, is to trap or fix the bubbles inside. As we mixed and kneaded, the comforting sounds of my childhood reasserted themselves. The steady hum of the powerful electric mixer my mother uses, the dough hook humming and coughing as it turned, and in harmony with it, 
the sound of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in the background, offering its perpetu perpetual mixture of grave-sounding news and bright-sounding Baroque music. A certain kind of Canadian, my mother, keeps the CBC on from early morning to bedtime, indiscriminately. Like most good cooks, my mother is sweet-tempered in the run-up to cooking and short-tempered in the actual event. For all its universality, bread's chemistry, or really biology, is, I realized as she explained it, a little creepy. She went on, the longer it takes the little bugs to eat up the oxygen, the better the bread tastes. The high heat of the baker's oven simply kills off the remaining little bugs while leaving their work preserved in place. It's all those carbon dioxide bubbles which become fixed as the nice spongy holes of the crumb of the bread. The tasty bits of your morning toast, I realized, are all the tombs of tiny dead creatures. The Ozymandias phenomenon on a miniature scale. Look on my works, you mighty, and eat them with apricot jam. I go on then to talk about learning to bake with my mother, who's a wonderful French baker who does, you'll forgive me for saying so, the best croissants still that I've ever eaten, or at least I should say the most densely buttery ones I've, I've ever eaten, and has actually invented a boisson, a cross between a brioche and croissant, with which she used to belabor us uh, in breakfast. Um, but what particularly fascinated me as, as um, as time went on is that my mother is uh, still alive, but fading somewhat and no longer uh, baking. And I meditated then on the nature of yeast again, but thinking of yeast not merely as a thing that passes gas to make the bubbles in your bread, um, but as something that uh, endures uh, past memory. I wrote not long ago, as I was finishing this book and talking to my parents in a pain stumbling manner, I began to think about the sourdough starter that my mother had cultivated for all those years. She's been keeping a sourdough starter, as bakers do, a mother for as long as she's been my mother, at least, which is 60 plus years. What would become of it when she was no longer there to make it or use it, I wondered. And then, speaking to a scientist expert in all things yeast, I found out something startling and oddly comforting. Not only does sourdough starter live forever, yeast begetting yeast, like one of those chains of generations in the Bible. But the traces of DNA from bakers long gone remain fertile within the starter. The schmutz is still present generations later. It is the traces that doubtless make the flavor. I recalled asking a gastronome what accounted for the extraordinary and distinct flavor of the smoked brisket at Schwartz's Delicatessen in Montreal. The schmutz in the smoke room, he said bluntly, schmutz is Yiddish for dirt. It was true. Once the back room was cleaned out, the savor and intensity of whole peppercorns was gone. Our mother's fingers stumble. Oh, and I should add perhaps too, because it was a fascinating thing that I found out that we, you can trace on the hands of French bakers in provincial villages um, DNA of sourdough that's at least two or 300 years old. It still is a vital on their hands. It has been passed down from one generation of bakers to the next. Our mother's fingers stumble as she ages. Yet our mother's hands live on. Shakespeare put his trust to immortality variously in marble monuments and rhymes. What will survive of us is love, another more famously sour po poet told us, Philip Larkin, a claimed hedge to be short by a sequence of almost. The truth is simpler. What will survive of us is sourdough starter. What will survive of us is schmutz. But then sourdough starter and schmutz being living, however lowly their life may be, are perhaps a safer guarantee of eternity than all the marble monuments in the world. That's my own little Proustian meditation on bread and yeast. And as you can see, and as I think is probably true for everyone in this room, our first sensory and taste memories are inexorably tied up with our childhood memories of mothers and fathers, grandmothers and great aunts, great uncles, and older brothers who first introduced us to the sensory world. So blessed to be on the stage with these master bakers. I wondered if I could ask um, each of you uh, when, what your first, your primary uh, original memory of taste and baking is that takes you back to your childhood as my mother's sourdough took me. So for me, is that one? Here, take mine. Yeah. Be better. Sorry. 
Uh, for me, actually, it goes back when I was five to six years old. It was from my dad who started baking uh, my birthday cake every year. I think for like 10 years. It was a simple uh, kind of Genoise, I would say, with uh, raspberry jam. And you're, where are you living at this moment? I was living in France, in France, no, yeah, in the west of France, in yeah. The west in the west of France, yeah, from Nantes. Nantes. This, yeah, uh, this area. Like Chartres de Chartres. Yes, exactly. Nantes. And then, uh, Nantes, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah? <laughs> See, We've we're neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> the cradle of French bacon, yes, <laughs> go on. <laughs> And then he will bake this, uh, this, this biscuit that you will do from scratch. It's can a secret recipe that you have, kind of a Genoise soft biscuit with jam. Roll it over. Looks more like a Yule actually for Christmas than a birthday cake. But it was, it was Noel the time. yeah, kind of Vigil Noel, but for my birthday, which is in May. But <laughs> and it was, uh, and he kept doing that same dessert for 10 years, you know, until I get I was 15 years when I started doing my um, working in pastry and bakery. So then I start doing, doing your formation in the yes, yeah, your formation, yeah, yeah, in Nantes, so yeah. So I'm going to say, go on. So yeah, that's what uh, my earliest remember of uh, sweet cake and stuff is from uh, when I was five or six, yeah, for this, uh, for my birthday, yeah, back from my dad. Yeah. Did you have any intimation at that moment that it would be something that you would do as a vocation for life? I had no, no. To be honest, <laughs> I had no idea. No, it started a bit, a bit uh, later when I was uh, 11 years old that I start having this passion for bread. I start being a baker first, and a few years after I start with, uh, with pastry. But uh, it, I don't know from where it came from, to be honest, yeah, maybe from this cake from my dad or something Sorry. else, but yeah. yeah. Is there, would you say that there's a difference between the vocation of a, a, a boulangerie and a patisserie? Is there a difference in, yes. does every, should everyone begin baking bread and then move on? I to don't think it's very connected, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there was a connection for me when I did actually my, uh, my first uh, formation in bakery. It included also chocolate. Uh, so it was also part of yeah, bakery, but also a side of pastry. And the logical uh, following of that was doing the pastry, uh, pastry formation. Right, right, yeah. sure. mm. So are you, are you, do you bake at all? Do, do you do bread at all now? At, I still in, doing the, some bread uh, more at home. A few also, we are, we are La Durée, we have some bread that we bake also ourselves, but I'm more on the pastry side now. Yeah, but yeah, I still yeah. love, I still have passion yeah, for yeah. bread. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Eugène, would you, same question to you. What, what's your key childhood memory, uh, your Proustian memory of uh. <laughs> bread taste and, and, uh, and, uh, and family? Yeah, so uh, when, I, when I was young, like maybe I, I think same thing, like five, six, seven years old, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. Um, they lived in a small town, and then they have their farms. Where, where, are, we, where are we living? In then? Korea, in Korea, <laughs> South Korea, and then south of South Korea. Uh, so yeah, so they, it was a small town, and then from uh, around nature and then they have a farm their farms so um, when i go there when i when i go there um, it was specific um, especially for during like new years and then thanksgiving like the family gathering so my grandma is for me is she's the best chef and then she cooked very well and she cooked for everyone um, but um, she record recorded uh, her from her farms, yes. and, and she cooked ses with the sesame uh, and rice, brown rice. So <clears throat> I had a fun to help her, and then made some sweet, uh, little sweet treats for everyone. So she um, toasted the brown rice and then rice and sesame buckwheat, and uh, we made a car can. Caramelized, okay. yeah, caramelized stuff. So it's a little uh, small. Um, like a bonbon. Yeah, yeah, like a bonbon. So it's called gangjong in Korean. So that's my uh, strong memory from childhood because uh, I grew up with smelling. I really loved the smelling like toasted brown rice and toasted. Mm. Uh, some cereal stuff, so that's why I made it uh, Madeleine with the toasted brown rice today. Yeah. So yeah, that's my childhood <laughs> memory. So we're getting an, an original, a, a hybrid. Of, yes, uh, of yes, the, from Madeleine, French Madeleine. Like Anna, <laughs> and your child, that's fantastic. Um, tell us a little bit, if you would, about because you work as a as a, a kind of trilateral hybrid a baker in New York and participating in many traditions. Growing up, was there a an indigenous and Asian Korean tradition of baking in, of the kind of uh, the French tradition 
emphasize this? Um, at the period, not at all. And then right now we have um, a lot of like French chef and then European style uh, pastry in Korea, but at that moment, no. But I, um, I really love baking and pastry. Um, so that's why I, dis I dreamed to be a pastry chef and uh, I wanted to go to France. So when I was 18 years old, I moved to France uh, by, mus by myself. That was a courageous <laughs> Yeah, <thing>. I say, <laughs> by mom and dad. And then I left, to Fran uh, I left Korea. And then I grew up in France uh, for professionally um, from, uh, from 2006 to 2016, so around 11 years. And then 2016, I moved to New York uh, to be uh, executive pastry chef at two Michelin star restaurant. Uh, and then now, which, which one was that? Cheongsik, uh -huh. Cheongsik yes, Korean right. yes, fine yes. dining restaurant in Tribeca. And uh, this year, I opened my own uh, pastry shop, uh, Lise, in Flatiron. Uh, to yeah, so this year on, in June. That's, so it's a, been that's six amazing. Months. Did you speak French when you went to study in French in France? Just bonjour. Je m'appelle Angie. Je suis coréenne. C'est tout. So you you attended school and and did your 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 formation in in baking and you had to learn French your French at the same time. Yes. So I before I uh, before leaving Korea I learned um, French a little bit in the French <coughs> Institute. But when I went to, when I arrived in France, um, for me everyone was so nice, and I learned a lot from just speaking with them naturally. And then, yeah, that's amazing. That's <laughs> courageous and amazing to have, <laughs> to have done it. Sebastian, the same the same question to same, you. Same same Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Excited to be uh, <clears throat> talking about Proust. Uh, I have to say, I like the Corinet, which was. Uh, the long Madeleine, which was easier to dip in your coffee or in your tea. <laughs> I like those better, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah. You, you have to do a new edition of Proust in which we I do, yeah, I do, yeah. In, in I'm gonna prove to him that the coronet is easier. Um, no, I came, you know, obviously I come from France. I moved here for, you know, 26 years ago. My grandma is my inspiration. She was uh, an amazing cook. My mom was terrible, so <laughs> we used to, uh, you know, we used to cook at my grandma. She was teaching me how to do stuff. Uh, my aunt at a restaurant across the street. In Nantes. In Nantes, yeah. So I spent a lot of time there, and you know, was not the brightest at school. So one day my dad says to me, you know, if you can't use your head, you're gonna have to use your hands. And uh, from that day, I said, okay, I'm gonna go in a restaurant and you know, do the best that I can. And then um, I became a pastry chef, you know? That's where I am today. I moved to the United States and uh, with no expectation to come here. And then here I am, 26 years later. And you did your, your formation in baking in, in Nantes as well? Yeah, in Nantes, Jimmy. yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah. In, a, in a school or with a, with a baker, as an apprentice to a baker? Well, we do the same thing. We have apprenticeship, which you spend, uh, one week at school and three weeks in the, the in a company. Um, so you do that for two years, and then after you, after that you pass your uh, diploma, and then after that I did uh, what they call BTM, which is uh, you know another step, and then after that you know at that time we had to do our military uh, duty, and uh, actually wanted to quit the industry because because it was so hard, and I was like you know have that it's just too much work, and then somehow I get. You know, I ended up at the um, Mess de l'Elysée and, uh, you know, to cook for, for a year. And then I'm like, I guess it's going to be my career forever then. I, I have always thought, because I've heard the same uh, succession from many uh, French bakers, I know that going into the military after baking all day must be very easy, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I had it pretty sweet, you know. We had to work from six to... Six to two, and then after that, we were free to do whatever we wanted. Right, yeah, so it was nothing. It was nothing, <laughs> nothing. We were going out every night. <laughs> the, um, I worked in a, in a three-star French kitchen for a couple of weeks for my own amusement when I lived in France, and I could not get over the degree of brutality involved in the, in the, in the transactions of the kitchen Absolutely. every day. Absolutely, did, you, yeah. did you find that to be true as well, Jimmy? I think it changed a lot here in like many years ago, 20 years ago, it was yeah. more brutal than now. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit more, but yeah, yeah. we were talking about passion before. 
you need to have passion for this kind of work. Yeah. To wake up at 4 a.m. every day is not uh, something that everyone can do, I guess. Yeah. And long hours standing, so yeah. And, uh, and uh, an, uh, a master who's hyper exacting, the teacher, the, the, your, the, the baker, is, is hyper exacting, yes, always wants it perfect. Yeah, yes, yes, so there is a lot of pressure here. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Yes, I, I, I wait a second. You, did you have the same? Same thing. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, discipline. You know, yeah. that's what we learn in the army is you know discipline and teamwork. You know, working with your with your friends and your teammates because at the end of the day we can't do it by ourselves. To be successful, you need to have a team that works with you. Yes, I, I've always had the sense too that uh, doing doing pastry or doing uh, bread baking is. Would you agree the most exacting of all of the culinary arts? Because there's no place in it for a mistake. You can't spill in a little too much of this or, or that. It almost has the exactitude of chemistry or of, of a science. Absolutely, yeah. But I think the best way to learn is to make mistakes. So you learn from your mistakes, and then it makes you better. I think many recipes were born from mistake, actually. Oh, yes, like really? Tartatan, like, yeah, many oh, tartatan is a, is a mistake? You have to explain a, that. Yeah, I think it was a mistake from the beginning, yeah. <laughs> they put the, the apple upside down, you know, instead of the top, and they bake it this way, so yeah. 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 And there was many, like, in bakery also, like we have different fermentation, like Polish, you know, which is um, yes. a lot of water with yeast and flour, leave it for hours. And that's also were born from a mistake of an apprentice, you know, who put too much water on, a, on the mix of, uh, of the bread. Yeah. 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 And, and then you get away with it if it works, if it, yes. makes, something, if it makes something good. Um, one of the things that obviously fascinates me is, of course, is the richness of uh, French literature about food, as well as, uh, as the French uh, uh, practice of it, too. It, in your own, in all, this is obviously for all of you. In your formation as a as a baker, did you read much? Did you ever have an opportunity to read Proust or to read more broadly about the the art of baking and memory of baking, or were you focused on the profession of it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Whoever. No, yeah. For me, no. Uh, for me, I focus more on the professional. Yeah, 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 on the. Mm -hmm. the well, no, I did not read any Proust, but... Uh, <laughs> then uh, Proust couldn't bake, so... Yeah, I guess so, yeah. We went to the same school, so... Yeah, you're that's even. right, yeah. You're, you're even. It fascinates me, though, what you were saying, uh, Sebastian, about your grandmother. I found that to be true so often, and it's one of the themes of Proust, of course, as all of you know, is that he's much more intimate, the, the narrator, is much more intimate with his grandmother than with his mother. The grandmother is the nurturing... Figure exactly. in the book is that is I think that's a particularity. It's of um, of uh, French family life. That's what it was for me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think every family is different. Yeah, for me it was a bit different. You know, it was with my father, which yeah. really is we more with the mother that you cook. I cook a lot more with my with my father. Yeah. yeah, he's the one who teaches me more more stuff about bread and dessert. Yeah. And and your family it, were not really. Oh, same as Sebastian. Uh, yeah. my mom was. Bad. And, my, <laughs> and, and my father was better to cook, and my grandma, she's, she was amazing. Yeah, no, exactly. My mother, as I explained in this book, was a passionate baker who went to France in the other direction from uh, being a Jewish girl in Philadelphia to learn her baking in France as well. She never practiced it professionally, but she then brought it back and uh, stuffed her six children uh, with these things as she became a... Uh, as she became a professor. Tell us a bit, if you each would, about how you approached the, the Madeleine challenge that we, that we, we gave you. So for, um, on La Durée side, we did a collaboration this year with Villa Albertine. So we created a box, a nice box. And we, we create a macaron with a Madeleine flavor. For uh, Madeleine de Proustien. Because La Durée does macaron yes. as, as, as a thing. Yeah. I am old enough to remember when La Durée was one little uh, store in store Paris in Hawaii, when, yeah. on the Rue Royale where we used to go with our, with our children for an omelet and, and a macaroon. Now it's an empire of, yes, yeah, a lot more. <laughs> of, of, of that too. And you? So uh, from Lise, we, uh, <laughs> we prepared the ma Madeleine. Uh, I really like the shape of Madeleine, so we just uh, stayed with the shape, uh, regular shape of Madeleine. And uh, as I explained, uh, previously, I uh, made a toasted brown rice flavor of Madeleine. So it's garnished with um, a brown rice caramel. And there are, at the bottom, we have a toasted brown rice powder. And uh, we, I, we glaze with uh, 
glaze of brown rice as well. So you have, uh, when you taste it, you have uh, like nerdy and toasty flavor. Oh, that's, so it truly flavor. is a hybrid yeah. uh, Asian, French, <laughs> that's French Asian. That's who I am, so. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for me, you know, Daniel is known for making Madeleine a la minute for every guest that comes at the, at the table. So we bake them, they take about five minutes to bake. So what I wanted to do is do, um, you know, using the same recipe and tweak it a little bit. You know, of course, there's a lot of butter in it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the season, you know, it's Christmas, you know, it's going to be a lot of gathering. You know, you're going to bring your friend at home, your family, and it's all, that's the spirit of holiday and we want to share food, you know. So my idea for today was to, you know, make a little loaf, you know, um, you know, uh, it's like a big Madeleine, if you will, uh, to, for you to take home and share with your friends and family. So on your way out, you will have one uh, waiting for you. That's fantastic, Sebastian. Thank you. That's like a little, what you call it, like a, a quatre croix of a, ma of a Madeleine. Yeah, now, should a Madeleine ideally have um, a, a, some kind of spirit, some kind of alcohol in it? Well, mine has a uh, Grand Marnier. Uh -huh. um, Good. And then on the inside, this. <laughs> French people, they love alcohol. Yes. <laughs> Americans, too. Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Koreans, too. OK, okay. good. <laughs> We share a similar corruption. Any, right, anywhere we go. So yours says Grand Marnier? And no alcohol. No alcohol. No, no alcohol. Well, I think we'll all try the Grand Marnier one then. In the, in the, 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 that's, um, that's, that's fantastic. Oh, I did want to add, by the way, I've mentioned in passing about Nantes and Jacques Demy, but if you're, there is an incredible vision of Nantes in the 1930s and 1940s in the wonderful film Jacques de Nantes by Agnes Varda, the great French filmmaker. And I urge everyone who hasn't seen that film to see it, whether you're a patriot of Nantes like our, like our colleagues or just a lover of French cinema. It's one of the most beautiful studies of, it's about her husband, uh, Jacques Demy, the, uh, to my mind, a supreme French filmmaker, and about his childhood in, in Nantes in those years. And it's got a wonderful, Charles Trenet's score, and I urge, if you haven't seen it, everyone, um, everyone in this room uh, certainly should. I know that um, today I stand as an obstacle between you and the chance to taste <laughs> this wonderful, the, the, do this wonderful tasting, but let me um, elongate the obstacle a little bit longer just by um, asking if you have questions to, for any of us, or for Dee, or for myself about Proust and the, um, and the psychology and alchemy of the Madeleine. Any quest question on any Proustian topic is welcome, or any baking topic for that matter. Yes, lady here. I'll repeat the question for if you couldn't hear it. The uh, question is, is for all of our, of our chefs, what's your favorite way to eat a Madeleine. And in Proust, of course, he dips it in tea. And that's, uh, and that's one way. But is there, do you have a favorite way, or should it not be corrupted? Should baking not be corrupted by liquid of any kind? Uh, for me, it would be, uh, like he was, uh, Sebastian was saying, a la minute, because you keep the freshness of the Madeleine, and uh, dip in hot chocolate. Oh. Say. Yeah. Oh, can we do that's that at La Durée? Yeah. This, sure, sounds, this course, sounds like yeah. a delicious. We can. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds delicious. Honey? For, for me, I prefer to eat with uh, tea or coffee for, because I think it's perfect for tea time. And uh, yes. Green tea or um, Darjeeling? What kind of tea should we indulge with? I personally really like the green tea and uh, some white tea too. So Earl Grey, Earl Grey or uh, whatever uh, tea not too strong uh, so you can enjoy the flavor of Madeleine. Fantastic. Sebastian? Uh, you know, as well, when I was younger, it would be hot chocolate, but now I'd rather have it in uh, my coffee. <laughs> That's what happens to us as we age, That's right? As we, we age, yeah, right. <laughs> we need less sugar and more caffeine to, to get, through, get through the day. Thank you for that question. Someone else. Lady back here. Stand up. Yeah, project and I'll repeat. I'm curious being Truth's favorite artist with Vermeer and how he kind of encapsulated and romanticized the everyday from a woman like pouring milk into a jug. Culturally, was the Madeleine or is it like a very common theme where he's chosen the Madeleine as something that is very common and he makes it something amazing, how like Vermeer does? Or is it more of a treat? I'm curious culturally. 
that's an so th that's an interesting question in 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 French culinary culture is the madeleine a refined um, uh, treat or is it a, a completely commonplace treat I mean then if you your point is is that if you were writing about a chocolate chip cookie in America you'd understand that it was completely popular whereas if you were writing about uh, a madeleine you'd know it was something refined what what's the what is the the place of a madeleine in, in French uh, baking and French culinary culture? Very common, or does it express refinement and... I would say very common, yeah. 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 Very common. It's something you can find in every bakery, in, in every pastry, yeah. Right throughout yeah. France in that way, too. Yeah, so it's part of Proust's ambition to take... I think you're exactly right. I think that's a, a wonderful analogy with Vermeer, who, of course, appears again and again in Proust, if some of you may remember in this first volume, uh, Swan, the hero of the first volume, is uh, Charles Swan. Uh, is obsessed with two things. He's obsessed with a Vermeer landscape and a patch of yellow in a Vermeer landscape, and with the face of the woman he falls in love with, Odette de, de Cressy, uh, yeah, Odette de Cressy, who um, resembles a Botticelli. Uh, from, it's one of my favorite little bits of snobbism <laughs> in Proust, because he, uh, he identifies Odette, if you recall, with a, a face in the Sistine Chapel in, the, in, in Rome, but the face isn't on the Michelangelo ceiling. It's on the Botticelli frescoes that are be below the ceiling. And only an esthete of Proust's generation and extreme refinement would refuse to look up. They thought of this Michelangelo ceiling as a bit vulgar and common. And they only looked down at the Botticellis in the lower register. But I think, to, but I think that you're exactly right, that one of the things Proust is doing in, in his book, and I. Dee's, the delight in Dee's reading reminded us, is he's saying anything, no matter how small or commonplace, contains the whole of eternity within it. That the, that the division we make in life between the elevated and the commonplace is always false. That it, the most commonplace things contain the most elevated emotions. So, and I think that's part of the profound humanism of Proust. So thank you for reminding us of that, of that truth. Gentlemen here. <laughs> <Pas dehors. laughs> it's how the recipe. Yeah, I think that's the answer, yeah. <laughs> A lot of butter, alcohol for some of us. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I get the texture, the texture uh, that we have in a Madeleine. The texture, the flavors, uh, yeah. It's a good mix of everything. I get the, the crunchy part on the outside, soft inside. I think the, the beauty of the Madeleine and Proust is less is more. I always say that to my staff, less is more. Some people try to make too, too many ingredients, too many things. The, thing, the beauty about the Madeleine is it's just a little cookie with not that many ingredients and it impacted so many people. That's, that's pretty remarkable for me. I, uh I love madeleine when it comes out from the oven. Um, and when you bake the madeleine, it smells really good. Um, it's very, <laughs> yeah, it's very beautiful smell in the kitchen. So yeah, that's why I, I think it's very buttery and also um, uh, crispy outside and soft inside. And uh, I love to use the brown butter uh, instead of regular butter inside. So you have more um, uh, strong flavor. So. Yeah, Madeleine is good. <laughs> you know, it's, fun, it's, it's, it's so interesting you say that, because I wrote a whole chapter in my book about the philosophy of eating, The Table Comes First, which is just about that principle, that deliciousness is really very simple in life. It's anything that's crispy on the outside and scrumptious on the inside. We human beings love. That's, our, that's the common thing. The other thing, thinking about what you're saying that comes to my mind is that um, so much of what's greatest in French cooking, but in French baking particularly, is not, though it's, I know how um, expert you have to be to, to, to make it, it's not in itself um, uh, necessarily that refined. There's something very simple and enfantine about the Madeleine or about the flan or about those, those simple delicious things that we, that we love in the, in the French repertoire. And I always think about how at uh, Paulin in Paris, at the, great, at the Great Bakers, they make bread and then they make an apple tart and a flan and that's it and it's sort of it's an announcement that that's that that's all you need absolutely 
in the, uh, another question. There must be more. Uh, lady here. Of course. Représente un, une coquille Saint-Jacques. Pourquoi uh, la Madeleine a la forme d'une coquille Saint-Jacques? Saint -Jacques? Does everyone understand the question? Or the lady is asking. She'd like to know why <laughs> the Madeleine has the form of what we would call a scallop of a coquille Saint-Jacques. Why does it have that shell form imprinted on it? And if you can't answer this question, you'll be deported back to France. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea. Why do you know, Jim? Yeah, the seven cells, my colleague. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no clue. <laughs> Any? Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't born then. <laughs> does anyone, I'll open it up to, does anyone have a theory about why that is? I know that the, you know, the reason it does is because the, the tray you bake it in has, has, has that form. But uh, I, as you can see, I have limitless theories, though very little information about all of these questions. And, and I think maybe it may be as simple as that it's, it's better for dipping to have all those, those ridges and that the ridges are there. Is that possible? Could be, yeah. <laughs> Could be, very polite. <laughs> It's a very polite way of a Frenchman saying no. <laughs> But thank you. More crusty surface. More crusty surface, more crispy outside for the scrumptious inside. That's a perfect answer. If I may, Wikipedia has another theory I just discovered. Ah. Is that it was a way to make the Madeleine more appealing for the pilgrims on their way to Saint-Jacques-de-Compostelle. Ah. That's a wonderful explanation. If that's not true, it just became true, because <laughs> it should be true. That's a wonderful in, in, uh, explanation, because it is indeed the form you see always in that, in that. I know we should move on and, uh, and allow everyone one last question, to test perhaps? question, but let's take one last question, please. One last question. Lady here. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Um, I just read a little book called Living and Dying with Marcel Proust, mm -hmm. and supposedly he claimed if he wasn't a writer, he would have been a baker. Yes, this is, this is true. I think that's probably not the case. It was one of those things writers say. You ask a writer something, <laughs> and they'll, they'll tell you what sounds good, because uh, Proust was a, a, a man of mind and, and body. And, but it is true, and it's one of the things that's very significant, I think, about Proust is a, as a kind of last thought before we go and enjoy these, uh, these wonderful things. We, we have an image of Proust in our heads very often of Proust as, a, as an elegant esthete of lassitude and refinement, and that's true. But Proust was an incredibly hard worker. Um, it, for all that he lived in a cork-lined room and was uh, ill or regarded himself as ill for m most of his life, he... Um, Everyone who knew him talked about the, his extraordinary work habits. You couldn't produce a, a, a book of that length, which he constantly revised and expanded, as um, Antonin Compagnon, the great Proust scholar at Columbia, reminded us in a symposium a few years ago. Um, the book was originally supposed to be half the length that it finally achieved, because the, the, the Albertine stories, which are a complicated personal tale for him, uh, expanded the book so much. And there's a wonderful uh, story in an English literary memo uh, memoir of someone, uh, I think it's Ford Maddox Ford, who knew Proust. And uh, Proust ran from his house to uh, Ford's um, auberge for in, in Dieppe just to invite him to dinner. Um, and uh, Proust was uh, a man of immense refinement, but also a man of uh, limitless energy, like any great baker. Um, thank you all for coming. Why don't we go and have a proper tasting? I just want to say thank you to, to you four to, to say that we are very happy to, to be with Elizabeth Holder, the CEO of La Durée, and I just want to say that uh, it was particularly relevant for the centennial of Marcel Proust, but also for the anniversary of La Durée, 160 years of pastry in France and now in the US, uh, that we started this uh, limited uh, edition about uh, this uh, Madeleine-flavored macaron. 
you will be literally the first, not only in New York, but on earth to try it, because it's really this weekend and today that we are starting this limited edition. Um, so beyond the tasting of this macaron, you will be able to, to buy it if you wish, either at the bookstore or at the La Durée locations or online, but just in the next few weeks, because once uh, we have been at the, at the bottom of the stock of uh, the, the, the Albertine box, uh, it won't be uh, done again. I just want to say that we are very lucky to have also, thanks to La Durée, not only hot chocolate to dip the Madeleine in it, but also tea, uh, of course, Linden Herbal Tea, like in La Recherche. Uh, so we are very fortunate to, to, to share with you now this tasting. Thank you again. Merci beaucoup for being part of this Proust weekend.